Hey, uh, so uh, welcome everyone uh, to the presentation on governance and SEC disclosure trends for banks. My name is Cam Huang and I'm a partner in the Capital Markets and Compliance Group here at Dorsey. So uh, in today's presentation, we're going to be covering the regulatory framework for SEC disclosure and governance and then related trends as they specifically impact banks and bank holding companies. And so why is governance and compliance important for banks? <clears throat> Weak governance and compliance, meaning the lapse in oversight or internal checks that prevent banks from violating the law, was the reason behind 41% of enforcement actions issued during the first half of 2019, according to an analysis by enforcement data of enforcement data by Navigant Consulting. Um, that is higher than in each of the previous four calendar years when governance was cited an average of 19% of enforcement actions. So much of today's discussion will be focused on public company policies and practices, but I ask our private company colleagues to bear with me as your institutions are increasingly asked to consider comparable policies and practices by your shareholders and your other stakeholders. So how does a company decide or sometimes find itself in the predicament of becoming a public company in the US? Um, a bank, bank holding company or savings and loan holding company is required to register a class of securities and become a public company if number one, it lists its securities on a national exchange, or two, it has more than 10 million of total assets and the securities are held of record by 2,000 or more persons. The company may terminate or suspend the registration if the securities are delisted or held of record by fewer than 1,200 persons. And actually, these thresholds reflect increases that were enacted in 2016 under the Jobs Act and the FAST Act. What does it mean to be a public company? Uh, U.S. public companies must comply with stock exchange listing standards as well as U.S. SEC disclosure rules, including annual, quarterly and current reporting and officer certification of financial results and enhanced financial disclosures such as of off balance sheet arrangements. They must have a majority independent board and then independent standing committees for audit, compensation and governance oversight. There has to be an independent auditor that's engaged to review their financials. There are disclosure controls and internal control assessments that they have to enforce. And uh, there is a pending SEC rule on clawback of executive compensation based on restated financials, which I believe has already been acted for many financial institutions through industry regulation. And as many of us know, many of these requirements uh, grew out of provisions of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act and the Dodd-Frank Act, um, which you know, were in response to seismic shifts in the US economy. We remember Sarbanes-Oxley was driven by the audit failures in Enron and WorldCom and then the resulting bankruptcies. And then Dodd-Frank grew out of the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008. More recently, there has been concern that these requirements are interfering with the competitiveness of US businesses and discouraging companies from going public. So they were scaled back for emerging companies by the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act of 2012, the Jobs Act. Financial institutions follow additional standards and guidelines depending on their regulators and the size of the institution. For bank holding companies and banks regulated by the Federal Reserve, this agency has been focused on enhancing the effectiveness of boards and specifically redirecting boards towards their core responsibilities in an effort to promote the safety and soundness of their organizations, as well as reducing unnecessary burdens for the boards of smaller institutions. Core responsibilities include oversight of the types and levels of risk an organization may take and aligning the business strategy with those risk decisions. In November of 2018, the Fed adopted a new rating system for large domestic financial institutions with a focus on capital, liquidity, and the effectiveness of governance and controls. There has been significant interagency collaboration on governance guidelines, particularly compensation guidelines in an effort to alleviate the uncertainty and confusion of multiple directives by different agencies. And in my mind, that is really the challenge going forward 
um, in regulating governance and disclosure is that there are so many agencies involved and often the requirements are overlapping. And so, you know, how, how do we keep investors and consumers safe while at the same time making regulation a bearable and efficient task for the companies that are regulated? Corporate citizenship is perhaps the most significant current topic in governance. The primacy of shareholder interests and whether corporations have social responsibilities that may conflict with shareholder interests are long-standing debates. So going back to 1962, economist Milton Friedman um, posited in his work, Capitalism and Freedom, that there is one and only one social responsibility of business, to use its resources and engage in activities designed to increase its profits. Mr. Friedman contended that to the extent that a corporate executive's social responsibility spending reduces returns to stockholders, raises prices for customers, and or lowers wages for employees, that executive is spending someone else's money for a general social interest. Former GE CEO Jack Welch had a slightly different perspective on things in that shareholder value is a result, um, not a strategy, and that focusing on employees customers and products and potentially other stakeholders is a way to increase the long-term value of a company. So while neither Mr. Friedman nor Mr. Welch would dispute the importance of long-term creation of shareholder value, um, they would perhaps disagree on which constituents should be the most productive focus for boards and executives. And you know, banks are in the crosshairs for the debate on corporate citizenship. Um, banks may finance a wide range of businesses with environmental and social impact, including oil and gas extraction, cannabis and opioid distribution, firearms manufacturing and sales. And at the same time, banks are visible leaders in the communities that they serve. And so they often can't afford to limit their focus to shareholder interests, but they really have to appreciate the interests of a broader group of stakeholders. In 2019, when the Business Roundtable issued its statement on the purpose of a corporation, 181 CEOs agreed that while each of our individual companies serves its own corporate purpose, we share a fundamental commitment to all of our stakeholders. This was a big shift for the Business Roundtable, um, whose official position since 1997 had been one of shareholder primacy. Financial services companies who signed the statement include American Express, Ameriprise, Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, Wells Fargo, and a number of other companies. So why did the Business Roundtable issue this statement now? The statement reflects a growing anxiety about the disparities in American society and that priving, private ordering may be needed to address some of those disparities. <clears throat> the American dream is alive but fraying, said Jamie Dimon, chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase. Major employers are investing in their workers and communities because they know it is the only way to be successful over the long term. These modernized principles reflect the business community's unwavering commitment to continue to push for an economy that serves all Americans. However, not everyone agreed with this statement. The Council of Institutional Investors was quick to reaffirm that boards and managers need to remain clearly accountable to the company's owners while sustaining a focus on long-term shareholder value. So directors may ask how their duties as fiduciaries to the shareholders align with the company's responsibilities as a corporate citizen. Uh, does this discussion change the fiduciary duties for directors and officers? You know, the fundamental corporate law of fiduciary duties has not changed. Directors still owe duties of care and loyalty to the corporation and its shareholders. And boards are still expected to make decisions based on available information that they believe to be in the long-term best interest of the company and its shareholders. Furthermore, the business judgment rule has not changed. Judicial deference for most board decisions remains intact under the business judgment rule. Delaware courts have long held that boards must serve the best interests of shareholders first and foremost, but they will typically defer to board decisions on what it means to promote shareholder value. There was a recent opinion in an eBay case where Chancellor Allen stated that when director decisions are reviewed under the business judgment rule, this court will not question rational judgments about how promoting non-stockholder interests 
be it through making charitable contributions, paying employees higher salaries and benefits, or more general norms like promoting a particular corporate culture ultimately promote stockholder value. Other jurisdictions like Minnesota are more explicit in allowing directors to consider the interests of stakeholders besides shareholders. Minnesota has had a permissive, quote unquote, other constituency statute on its books since 1987. And it's one of the 25 states with such a statute, which were generally adopted in response to threats of hostile takeovers on local companies and local communities during that time. In theory, the board could take actions counter to shareholder interests. Commoners have observed that given Minnesota's constituency statute, a court should sustain a board's acceptance of a takeholder proposal that retains employees and a community presence, but is slightly less advantageous to shareholders than another proposal that would result in plant closings and sales of substantial assets. However, this theory has not been tested. Moving off of corporate citizenship and turning to uh, compliance, another governance trend we see is greater atten attention to risk management and to compliance. Organizations supervised by the Federal Reserve, regardless of size and complexity, should have effective compliance risk management programs that are appropriately tailored to the organization's risk profiles. However, the risk management landscape is rapidly evolving, with boards having to plan for and react quickly to developing risks, including cybersecurity incidents, environmental and social issues, macroeconomic disruptions, and the unpredictable impact of government and public policy. In 1996, the Inray Caremark case was a wake-up call for boards that in order to fulfill their duty of care, they must be mindful in their oversight of risk and compliance programs. And since then, we have seen a remarkable expansion of corporate risk and compliance programs. It was truly a wake-up call for boards. And the court made clear that they have an active duty of supervision and monitoring risk and compliance programs. Delaware judges have noted that proving a Caremark claim is the most difficult fiduciary duty breach to find because it requires a showing of bad faith on the part of directors. Nonetheless, in 2019, at least two different Delaware courts refused to dismiss claims involving two kinds of potential Caremark oversight failures. Number one, the failure to implement any board oversight policies, and number two, the failure to actively monitor those policies that were previously adopted by the board. These cases implicated not only the director's duty of care, but also their duty of loyalty, which means that the director can be found personally liable and cannot be indemnified by the company. Some takeaways from the recent cases include that failing to have policies and procedures in place to ensure timely reporting up to the board is dangerous. Furthermore, failing to connect the dots to appreciate systemic versus isolated risk is dangerous. And finally, failing to have solid controls in place for highly regulated businesses is also dangerous. Turning our focus to audit and risk committees, audit committees have been receiving more attention recently because of their vital role in the financial reporting system. So in a December address, SEC leaders reminded audit committees that they play a vital role in the financial reporting system and highlighted a number of topics that deserve continuing attention. First of all, non-GAAP measures. Uh, it's important that audit committees understand whether and how and why management uses non-GAAP measures and performance metrics and how those measures are used in addition to GAAP financial statements in the company's financial reporting and in connection with internal decision making. Because without the use of generally accepted accounting principles, it's really hard to compare companies' um, performance. Another a subject of focus for audit committees as encouraged by the SEC is, the, is reference rate reform, so the LIBOR transition that many of you may be familiar with. The expected discontinuation of LIBOR could have a significant impact on financial markets and may present a material risk for many companies. Finally, critical audit matters. Beginning in 2019, certain public companies' auditors are required to communicate critical audit matters, or CAMs, in the auditor's report. So what is a critical audit matter? It relates to accounts or disclosures that are material to the financial statements 
and involve especially challenging, subjective, or complex audit or judgment. I really think the key word there is, is judgment. If they're making some critical judgments about sub significant matters, it needs to be pointed out to the audit committee. Uh, there has to be awareness of that. In a survey of critical audit matters identified for 52 larger filers with fiscal years ended June 30th, 2019, Deloitte found that the most common matters involved the valuation of goodwill and intangible assets, revenue recognition, and income taxes. Another key audit committee function is the engagement of independent auditors. Uh, and the committee makes determinations on their independence. So in December of 2019, the SEC proposed to modernize auditor independence rules, in part to facilitate the audit of affiliated companies by the same auditor. Um, if the AICPA and the PCAOB take a cue from the SEC proposal, auditor independent standards could change for both public and private financial institutions. So applicable auditor independent standards depend on the financial institution's asset size and whether or not it's public. Uh, the table that I've included here is from the FDIC website and it just pr provides a useful reference on which auditor independent standards are applicable. Under the original Dodd-Frank Act, uh, bank holding companies with more than $10 billion in assets were required to have risk committees. That threshold was raised to $50 billion in 2018 to ease the regulatory burden on small banks. But the Federal Reserve may require that bank holding company establish a risk committee regardless of its size. Under the Federal Reserve's Regulation YY, risk committees must have a formal written charter approved by the board, meet at least quarterly, have at least one risk management expert, and be chaired by an independent director. For banks that are not required to have a risk committee, factors to consider in whether to establish one include whether the bank has a complex business model, whether a bank has the internal resources to support a risk committee in addition to an audit committee, and whether the risk committee would be prepared for regulatory oversight. So according to a 2019 survey by Deloitte, only about 20% of companies surveyed had a standing risk committee, but the percentage is certainly to be higher among banks and, and bank holding companies. Once a decision has been made to establish a risk committee, its duties must be articulated and differentiated from the duties of other committees. For example, risk issues that are forward-looking and strategic could be addressed by the risk committee and other issues, for example, compliance oversight, could remain with the audit credit and, and other committees. While the functioning of risk committees is easily deserving of its own seminar, um, these committees may oversee categories of risk, including likelihood and potential impact, risks arising from performance pressure and compensation incentive systems, any impact of environmental and social risks on financial performance, and the company's risk appetite. And there are high stakes, as everyone in the room is aware. Uh, material failures of risk oversight lead to litigation, bad publicity, votes against directors, and recommendations for changes in board leadership. Turning to compensation committees, while there is no significant compensation rulemaking in 2019, oversight of incentive compensation arrangements continues to be a focus for bank regulators. As background, banks that receive government assistance under TARP are prohibited from paying bonuses, awarding stock options, and paying severance to their senior executives. They must limit restricted stock awards to no more than a third of total compensation, adopt clawback provisions, and conduct compensation risk reviews twice a year. All financial institutions are required to evaluate incentive compensation and related risk management controls and governance processes, and to address deficiencies or processes that are inconsistent with safety and soundness. Specifically, the board is responsible for ensuring that incentive compensation arrangements for all covered employees, not just the senior executives, are appropriately balanced and do not jeopardize the safety and soundness of the organization. A compensation committee must actively oversee ICAs and directly approve ICAs for senior executives. They have to monitor the performance and regularly review the design and function of ICAs and for banking organizations that are significant users of ICAs, 
review the arrangements on both a backward-looking and a forward-looking basis. Other functions, including compliance, internal audit, and risk management need to be involved in the process. These requirements have prompted banks to consider compensation design changes to moderate incentive payouts and risk, while still emphasizing pay for performance. These design changes may include increasing base salary to offset decreases in variable pay, lower opportunity targets and lower caps on incentive pay, deferral of a portion of incentive payout, clawback provisions, diversification of incentive metrics, longer vesting periods for equity awards, and stock ownership guidelines for officers. Many of these design changes and specific thresholds are influenced by the proposed rulemaking for Section 956 of the Dodd-Frank Act. Looking to disclosure trends, the SEC under Chair Jay Clayton has embarked on a series of rulemaking initiatives to modernize and simplify disclosure requirements for public companies. For bank holding companies, Industry, 3, uh, Industry Guide 3 requires statistical disclosures related to interest earning assets and interest bearing liabilities, which are intended to help investors assess loan portfolio risks. The SEC's proposed updates in September of 2019 would replace Industry Guide 3 with a new subpart 1400 of Regulation SK, eliminate disclosure requirements that overlap with SEC and accounting standard requirements, update disclosures from last substantive revision in 1986 for changes in the industry and significant financial reporting changes, including the issuance of new accounting standards. Industry Guide 3 disclosures are commonly found in a public company's annual report on Form 10-K, in tabular form in the description of business, or in management's discussion and analysis of financial condition and results of operations. The proposed rule would apply to banks, bank holding companies, saving and loans associations, and savings and loan holding companies registered with the SEC. The proposed rules would require disclosure for shorter periods. The current industry guide calls for five years of data on the loan portfolio and summary of loan loss experience and three years of all other information. In contrast, the new rule would require disclosure consistent with SEC rules for financial statements which generally require two years of balance sheets and three years of income statements, with less demanding requirements for smaller reporting companies and emerging growth companies. However, there will be an emphasis on the disclosure of credit ratios, uh, and the disclosure would be required for each of the last five years in initial registration statements. The SEC emphasizes more detail on credit ratios and net charge-offs in its updates to Industry Guide 3 is also interested in making investors more aware, to the extent there is loan or deposit growth, what is driving that growth. The proposed rules would codify current disclosure on distribution of assets, liabilities and stockholders' equity, the related interest income and interest rates and interest differential. However, it would require further disaggregation of interest earning assets and interest bearing liabilities in a standardized format and level of detail to help investors understand whether material increases are due to increases in price, volume, or due to the introduction of new products or services. The guide would codify current disclosure on weighted average yield of investments in debt securities by maturity, but change the categories presented. And furthermore, the proposed rule slims down disclosure requirements on investment portfolios because of overlapping requirements in existing accounting standards. The guide would codify current disclosure on maturity analysis of the loan portfolio, including the amounts that have, been pre that have predetermined interest rates and floating or adjustable interest rates, but it would eliminate overlaps with SEC, rule, SEC rules and accounting standards. It would also codify current disclosure on the allocation of the allowance for credit losses eliminating analysis of loss experience. Another change would be the disaggregation of the net charge-off ratio based on loan categories in the financial statements. The commission believes that revising the current loan categories to conform to those that are required by accounting standards would promote consistency of disclosure throughout a filing. The net charge-off ratio would be disaggregated based on these loan categories. <clears throat> 
something that will be a little bit more difficult for banks going forward. Industry Guide 3 currently permits the exclusion of certain loan categories, um, for example, real estate, mortgage, installment loans to individuals, and lease financing, and the aggregation of other loan categories um, for disclosure on maturity and sensitivity to changes in interest rates. And the proposed rules would actually uh, not allow banks to exclude any of these loan categories or permit the aggregation of any loan categories. Uh, furthermore, the proposals would add three new credit ratios uh, presented on a consolidated basis along with each component used in their calculation. Uh, add discussion on the factors that drove material changes in the credit ratios or related components during the periods presented. Add a tabular breakdown of the allowance for loan losses for registrants applying or reconciling to US GAAP rather than permitting an alternative option to provide a narrative discussion and codify current disclosure of information about bank deposits, including amounts that are uninsured. And so the proposals were subject to a 60-day public comment period that ended at the beginning of December 2019, uh, even though if anyone is really interested in commenting, I'm sure you could still reach out to the SEC. Among other items, the proposed rules would not require disclosure of return on assets and return on equity ratios, which can be figured out based on other disclosure, and short-term borrowings. Instead, registrants will be expected to disclose the average balance and related average rate paid for each major category of interest-bearing liability and further disaggregate the major categories of, of interest-bearing liabilities. So that was a little bit of a deep dive, dive into Industry Guide 3. Uh, I'll just go more quickly over some uh, FAST Act amendments to disclosure. Here also, the SEC was attempting to modernize and simplify disclosure, um, and in this case, to annual reports on Form 10-K and, and proxy statements. And changes relevant to upcoming annual reports include uh, flexible periods for management's discussion and analysis of financial condition and results of operations so that registrants may discuss two rather than three years of financial results if the earliest year is included in prior filings and is not material to, to the current discussion. There's also a streamlined confidential treatment request process which allows registrants to omit confidential information from material contracts without filing a request to the SEC as long as the information is not material and would likely cause competitive harm to the registrant if publicly disclosed. And there's a new exhibit describing the securities that are registered with the SEC. And for those who are interested, you can consult the appendix to this presentation for a more complete summary of, of FAST Act changes. <clears throat> Another disclosure trend uh, that well, many companies, including banks, are really focused on these days is uh, disclosure on environmental, social, and, and governance issues. So in a recent ISS policy benchmark survey, 60% of investors responded that all companies should be assessing and disclosing climate-related risks and taking actions to mitigate them where possible. Investor interest has created momentum for a coalition of investors led by As You So to file climate change risk reporting shareholder proposals at major banks, including Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. Now, some of you may be wondering how bank activities are related to climate change. Activists are targeting the financing of projects that are associated with climate change. So, for example, JP Morgan is the largest source of financing for fossil fuel companies globally, averaging $65 billion annually since the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Here's a chart that shows the most commonly submitted shareholder proposals in 2019. Compared to 2018, lobbying and political contributions proposals surpassed environmental proposals, which wasn't entirely surprising given our current political environment and the upcoming elections. Human capital management proposals, specifically addressing the gender pay gap, workplace diversity, and reports on sexual harassment policies emerged as a popular topic. Where companies try to exclude proposals from shareholder votes, the proponents on rare occasions litigate or more frequently launch a vote no campaigns against these companies' directors. 
So, for example, the New York City Pension Fund waged a vote no campaign against the Exxon board when a climate change proposal was excluded. Overall, there was declining average support for environmental proposals in 2019, with shareholder support averaging 25.6% of votes cast compared to 32.8% in 2018. But that's actually still pretty sizable support from uh, shareholders, and they're not necessarily looking for a majority vote. They're just looking for additional attention and focus on these topics. In addition, board diversity and qualifications continue to be popular uh, topics for shareholder proposals. There continues to be great interest in environmental and social disclosure, with more companies dedicating sections of their proxy statements to describing these initiatives. 40% of the S&P 500 voluntarily address some aspect of sustainability in financial filings. But before including such disclosure, companies really need to carefully consider whether they're focusing on the appropriate initiatives based on stakeholder interest and the company's interests, as well as the company's views on corporate citizenship. Information that is included in public filings, and in particular information that's incorporated by reference, need to be vetted for accuracy and completeness. And so if a client comes to me and says, hey, we want to incorporate our website by reference, eh, well, you know, you might want to be careful about what you're, you're putting up there because often, you know, it doesn't get the closest uh, attention from the legal department. In remarks in March of 2019, uh, Bill Hinman, who is a director over at the SEC, noted that staff is watching carefully as market-led approaches develop in this area. And the staff is actively comparing the information companies voluntarily provide, typically outside of their SEC filings, with the disclosure that is filed with the commission and which is you know, subject to liability through SEC enforcement or through shareholder derivative suits. Among the S&P 250, investor interest also continues to drive governance disclosure. 65% of companies include a graphic to show board tenure diversity, up from 49% in 2018. 34% of companies use a graphic to show board age diversity, up from 20% in 2018. And there are a lot of other topics you know, that are getting attention to. Um, you know, companies are very anxious to show that their leadership, you know, their executives and their directors are focused on governance and these social issues. They'll include a cover letter in filings um, from the chairman or the CEO. Um, they're including graphics that show that directors are subject to a rigorous evaluation process and there are high standards for who's getting on boards. And they're also anxious to show engagement with shareholders and so they'll often try to illustrate that with, uh, with graphics or other disclosure. Public companies disclose material risks to their business in their annual report on Form 10-K. Uh, so evolving risks that are receiving greater consideration this year include data privacy and cybersecurity. And so that's just a, a continuing trend. But it's magnified because companies are having to comply with the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation and the California Consumer Privacy Act. And they face significant penalties if they do fail to comply. On the topics of climate change and ESG risks, so in a March 2019 address, once again, uh, the SEC reminded companies of the need to regularly assess their disclosure obligations at the, as they pertain to climate-related okay. issues. And banks are taking a closer look at environmental and social risks in deciding whether to lend money to certain corporate borrowers. So 67% of banks screen their loan portfolios for environmental, social, and governance risks, according to a survey by Rich, uh, Fitch Ratings. And though banks rarely decline to lend purely based on ESG factors alone, some banks are making commitments to stop lending to companies in industries that are viewed as high risk, such as those that operate private prisons or manufacture firearms. For others, it involves collaborating with credit underwriters, sustainability experts, and investor relations executives to review the potential credits. Uncertainty of government regulation results in increased costs and compliance risk. For example, uh, banks face the prospect of having to navigate different sets of rules for the Community Reinvestment Act if the Federal Reserve, the OCC, and the FDIC can't resolve competing plans for the industry. And to make the situation even more complicated, New York and California are taking steps 
to give their consumer financial protection regulators more power, as they say, federal oversight has stalled. IP and technology risk from international operations. In December of 2019, the SEC issued guidance encouraging companies to assess the risks related to the potential theft or compromise of their technology, data, or intellectual property in connection with their international operations. So for banks with overseas operations, risk to fintech assets may require assessment. Underlying credit risk. There were only four bank failures in the U.S. during calendar year 2019, and all the, they all involved small banks. However, according to a Wall Street Journal article in January, some bank analysts and former regulators say the low number of failures may be a sign that hidden risk is building. The FDIC's vice chairman is saying that when, this is when the bad loans are made. Um, banks are tempted to loosen lending standards and uh, debt among non-financial firms is close to a record high relative to gross domestic product. And in fact, debt is rising fastest among companies with lower credit ratings. But there is some comfort that as a result of controls put in place in the last financial crisis, banks now have much more substantial capital buffers. In addition, they're much more tightly supervised than in the past. One particular risk factor that has received considerable attention from the SEC is the expected transition away from LIBOR as a reference rate at the end of 2021. Chairman Jay Clayton has identified it as a major market risk and has stated that the SEC will continue to monitor disclosure and risk management efforts. The transition away from LIBOR is expected to impact $199 trillion of derivatives, $1.3 trillion in variable rate commercial and consumer loans, including home mortgages, student loans, credit card and auto loans, syndicated loans, and deposits based on a spread from LIBOR. The transition will create legal and financial risk by changing a rate specified in existing contracts. While most loan agreements contain some contingency language, this language may not cover a situation where the reference rate becomes permanently unavailable or may allow a change in reference rate, but not in the spread over the rate. <clears throat> ISTA is working on proposed model contract language for financial instrument, instruments to facilitate the substitution for LIBOR. And likewise, the Federal Housing Finance Authority is working on proposed contract language for residential mortgages. Potential alternatives to LIBOR include the secured overnight financing rate, which was developed by the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, established by the Federal Reserve Bank branch in New York, and Ameribor. The FDIC ultimately believes that the use of a particular rate is a business decision that's based on the needs and circumstances of each institution. SEC leadership has commented extensively on disclosure requirements related to LIBOR transition. For their annual disclosure documents, companies should consider whether to disclose the status of their efforts to evaluate and mitigate risks related to legacy LIBOR-linked instruments. If a company has identified a material exposure to LIBOR, it should consider disclosing that fact, even if it does not yet know or cannot yet reasonably estimate the expected impact and companies will need to consider the effects LIBOR transition will have on their accounting policies and financial statements, including the impact it may have on their hedge accounting and their ability to manage and hedge exposures to fluctuations in interest rates. The New York State Department of Financial Services is requiring that each regulated institution submit a LIBOR cessation and transition risk plan by February 7th of 2020 which includes planning for risks, alternative rates, and customer communications. Some banks have established LIBOR transition offices and are hiring program management leads to, to guide the transition. And we actually have some supplemental materials and a checklist for this transition from a prior seminar, which will circulate in the email follow-up. Uh, let's see here. So, let's see. That is actually the end of my program, which might not necessarily be a bad thing because it'll allow you additional time to you know, talk amongst yourselves and, and socialize. But before we close, is there, are there any questions I can answer or comments from the audience? Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time. And there are refreshments in the back. You uh, continue conversation. Thank you. <laughs>